All right, everyone. So my name is Jesse, and I am the lead on the Conservation Stories Canada project, where over all of 2021, I'll be heading to every province and up to the territories in Canada to feature amazing stories of passionate people working to save wild habitats and wild species coast to coast. Today, I am joined by Dr. Bill Halliday. He is with the Wildlife Conservation Society and the University of Victoria, and his work has him going all across Canada in pursuit of some really cool and unique stories of science. So, Bill, thank you so, so much for joining us here today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So your work is around acoustics. You seek to understand um, the sort of soundscapes of wild animals in the Beaufort Sea, one of the most incredible places in the world, and off the coast of where you live in British Columbia. So when you're going to these field sites, when you're doing this work, what does that look like? How do you actually get to these places to do this work in the first place? Great question. You know, around here on Vancouver Island, it's... Um, easy. I drive in my car and what I've done around here actually involves me hopping out of my car and wading into the water and dropping a hydrophone into the water um, or relying on students to do the work, which has been more the case lately. Going up to the Arctic, on the other hand, that's a whole other deal. Um, we're talking about first day of flying is from here to Whitehorse. So flying over to Vancouver and then flying to Whitehorse. Then I have to overnight in Whitehorse. And then the next day, usually I take another flight that takes me up to Dawson and then eventually up to Inuvik, which is kind of the, the hub for the Inuvialuit settlement region where I work. And, you know, that's that's a whole half day just getting from Whitehorse up to Inuvik. But then I'm in Inuvik and I'm not even near the ocean yet. Inuvik is um, up on the Mackenzie Delta, far, far away from the ocean. And I work in communities that are coastal. So then I have to get to there, which involves either um, hopping on a, a scheduled flight from the local air carrier which happens twice a week effectively. Uh, and that's usually a, a two to three hour flight um, or getting a charter flight that'll take me to the community. And then usually if I've got a charter, it means I'm going further. So um, up to the north end of Victoria Island, for example. Yeah. Uh, so lots of flying to get where I go. And then once you're there, so what are you actually doing? What does it look, I mean, you talk about wading into the surf in BC, which I'm imagining you're getting very strange looks from people on the shore. Uh, once you get up to the Arctic, how do you get these sensors out there? What does this actually look like? How many are you putting? Like, what's the deal? Yeah, so so these sensors are, um, they're called hydrophones or um, acoustic recorders. Effectively, they're just an underwater microphone that lets us uh, record different sounds um, underwater. Uh, so a couple different ways. If we're going with communities, we hire on a local community member with a boat and they'll drive us out to a site that we're interested in. And then we just throw the gear over the side and leave. Uh, <laughs> we don't just throw it there without a way of getting it back, of course. Um, uh, there's uh, we, we put out drag lines on the bottom or, um, or an acoustic release device that'll let the thing float to the surface when we send it a signal. Uh, so that's what we do at communities. Um, when we have a charter flight and we're going to a remote spot, then we've got a deflated Zodiac and an outboard engine on board the plane. And we pull it out, out, out onto the beach after we've landed on a very remote beach that's kind of a bumpy landing. The specialized planes that are meant to land on these things with huge tires that can deal with various bumps. Um, You've never been on a plane like this, probably. Uh, they're called twin otters. And the tires are called tundra tires, of all things. Um, so we pull out our Zodiac, and then we have to get a battery-powered air pump to pump the thing up, hope that we have enough juice in the battery to get the thing appropriately pumped, throw on the engine, hope that the engine didn't flood while we were flying around on the plane, which has happened. That was a fun experience. Uh, and then going out into often ice-covered Arctic Ocean with um, this tiny little Zodiac looking for the appropriate spot to, to drop a recorder in the water. So, so that's an adventure. We've also done it where we land on the sea ice and drill a hole in the ice and drop our gear down that way. And that sounds easier, but it comes with its own challenges, such as minus 30 Celsius um, and electronics not working. And then the final way that we do it, and this is actually one of the nice things about me being in Victoria, is we work with um, Fisheries and Oceans Canada as well as the Coast Guard ship. And so I drive down to the Institute of Ocean Sciences in Sydney, not far away, and I give them my gear and I tell them how to use it. And then they take their boat up to um, up to the Arctic, all the way from Victoria, um, and they do their summer cruise and eventually they drop our gear over the side and pick up other things that they've dropped in past years. Yeah. Um, so many different ways of getting gear in the water. And then we have to get it back a year later. 
Yeah. So this is, I mean, intense dedication. And so what are you listening for? Like, what are you picking up with all these hydrophones? Yeah. So, so thing number one are the animals, right? We're talking about conservation. So we're talking about species of interest. So in the, in the Arctic, I'm listening for bowhead and beluga whales, ring seals and bearded seals, um, as well as fish. They all make very different sounds that we can identify. Um, so that's thing number one. Thing number two is um, measuring underwater sound levels. So first of all, thinking about kind of natural variation and how loud it is underwater, but then also looking at how human activities are impacting that. Yeah. So measuring how loud it is when a ship goes by and thinking about that from the perspective of the animal, um, thinking about, you know, how loud it is for that animal, what that animal is going to do when it hears that sound, you know, kind of what are the implications of that sound for the animals. Yeah. So, I mean, before we dive into the conservation implications of this, I just want the, the personal element. So the entire ecological movement of the, the late 60s, early 70s, a lot of it was built off this fact of hearing whale sounds and how impactful that was, how beautiful that was. When you pick up these recorders, you, you've waited a year, you've got them, you're listening to this for the first time. I mean, what is that? that you're, you're listening in on a world that so few people get the actual chance to hear from. That must be such a, a fantastic experience for you. It's probably the most enjoyable part, um, f discovering new things and new data sets. We recently got one back from an area called Minto Inlet, so that's on Victoria Island. Mm -hmm. And um, it's the quietest recording I've ever heard. It was super cool um, all year round, even in the open water season, which is usually pretty, pretty noisy as waves crash and, and things. This is a fairly sheltered site. And so listening to the first beluga whales come into that was just, it was eerie. It was, you know, quiet, silent. And then suddenly this high pitched beluga whistle coming through, it was super cool. And it's so quiet that you can even hear the echo of the beluga whistle. So the, the, the just crisp call comes through and then, you know, just a couple milliseconds later, you get an echo of it come through and uh, it was just, it was just neat. And it's that way every time we discover something new um, as we're listening to these data sets. How magical is that? That is, that's amazing. Um, professional detachment aside, that is just the, the coolest thing. Uh, so what are we finding? I mean, one of the stories that's come about in some of the interviews I've done so far is the changing Arctic. There are more people heading up there than ever, whether that's commercial shipping, whether that's mining, whether that's tourism. And so are we noticing louder soundscapes underwater? Are we seeing it where animals are being impacted by this in any way? Or are we at the early stages of research where we're we're looking towards that in the future. Yeah, so so I would have to say that, that ours and, and our acoustic recordings are early stage just because we've only been doing the recording since 2014. I can't say that we've seen an increase per se in that time. Like there, there have been increases in kind of overall ship traffic in the Canadian Arctic over that period, but not enough that we're really noticing it in, in our acoustic data yet. But, you know, looking at the patterns, if I had had recordings from 20 years ago, there would have been five, maybe at most 10 ships that have come through this region in the summer. Whereas right now we're talking about 20 to 30. So, yeah. so it's, you know, compared to where I live right now in the Salish Sea, where we get that many ships in a day or over two days, um, it's, it's just a drop in the bucket. But for the Arctic, where these animals haven't had to deal with that, um, and where the animals will react at just incredible distances. Belugas and narwhal have been shown to react to ships from 50 kilometers away, wow. which is just, it, you can't even comprehend that distance. Humans in the air, we don't hear things that are 50 kilometers away unless it's like a nuclear bomb going off or something like that. This yeah. is just a regular old ship that can be heard just because sound propagates so efficiently in water. Um, so imagine going from never hearing ships to you know, having a few every year, but that's not a big deal. To suddenly having a tripling of ship traffic, and that that can potentially be a big deal for these animals. Yeah, and so in what way is it a big deal? I know that in British Columbia we're seeing this a lot, but there's much more shipping traffic there. You have whales off the coast of BC, and so I, I know that some action has been taken to sort of mitigate the risk to whales and, and marine mammals in general in the harbors there. What is the risk? So if they're hearing this noise, what can it lead to for them that is such a negative influence? Yeah, the, the very first thing is um, what we call acoustic masking. So the animal has trouble hearing things that it's trying to hear. Mm -hmm. So if it's a beluga, uh, belugas are incredibly vocal and very social animals. It's been shown in the St. Lawrence um, estuary, where the most southern population of beluga is, uh, that mothers and calves, which stay in contact with, with each other through vocalizations, they can't stay in contact anymore. 
It's actually mm -hmm. one of the hypotheses for why there have, has been increased calf mortality for belugas in the St. Lawrence. So hearing, just, just being not being able to hear what you're trying to hear is, is an important impact. Now that's the St. Lawrence where they're getting tons and tons and tons of ships going through. So, you know, it's a very high proportion of each day that these animals aren't being able to hear. So that's not really the case in the Arctic, but even still, every time a ship comes by, there's that impact. The animal probably has trouble foraging when a ship comes by because it can't hear its own echolocation clicks. That's been shown very well with um, Southern resident killer whales here in BC is that they have to stop foraging when a ship goes by simply because they can't do it anymore because they rely on their hearing to, to echolocate to find their food. The next big big one is a behavioral disturbance. So I was talking about um, belugas reacting to a ship from 50 kilometers away. What those belugas did was they fled the area. They heard the ship and they hightailed it out of there and they stayed gone for two days before they came back. So imagine that the belugas are there in that area for a good reason in the first place, whether it's a good foraging habitat, it's a good area for socialization, maybe it's got some warmer water and they're trying to thermoregulate. Um, that part's a bit of an unknown, but the point is they were there for a reason. They chose to be there for a reason, and now they can't be there anymore because the ship caused them to go away. There's a, an energetic cost associated with that. There's loss of foraging opportunities potentially that goes along with that. Those are effectively the big impacts that we see. Yeah. Um, hearing damage can happen if the animal is too close to that noisy ship, especially if it's a really noisy ship. Um, and then there's also, of course, if the ship runs over the whale, the whale can die from being hit by the ship as well. So there's a lot of different shipping impacts, but even just those basic can't hear um, anything when the ship goes by, change your behavior when the ship goes by, all of those add up, right? It's not like you, you take them, it's not like it happens and then it doesn't matter. It can happen again with the same consequences. All of those consequences are cumulative yeah. and can add up through time. The issue is whales are very long lived and we don't really know what those long-term implications are. So that's definitely a goal for a lot of different people is trying to figure out what those long-term implications are. Yeah, I mean, it's so fascinating to think about these animals that have such a different way of navigating their world and understanding their world than we do. I mean, we're so visual based as humans and to think that you, you get this this soundscape that is your your the essence of your being, whether you choose to mate, whether you choose to eat, uh, how you choose to gather with other members of your species. I mean, that is, uh, again, uh, disheartening to hear that there's so many impacts that, that can come from shipping and from enhanced vehicle traffic. And so I guess uh, a potentially positive, potentially disheartening sort of final question is, when we discover this with the research that you're doing, um, and again, this isn't necessarily the case in the Beaufort Sea just yet, but where it's been discovered that there's a lot of impact for whales, do we take positive action? Like has the Canadian government taken positive action to make sure that there's less of an impact on certain populations of marine mammals? Yeah, so the Species at Risk Act has done a good job of forcing them to, <laughs> effectively. So three big stories on on kind of shipping and impacts on marine mammals and the government taking positive action are happening right now across Canada. Yeah. So that's with southern resident killer whales, um, where the government is proactively looking into ways to um, ways to conserve those animals, ways to uh, protect them. So, so setting aside critical habitat where fishing can't happen, um, setting, um, being involved in slowdowns um, with ship traffic in here. Although that's not, that's not a government mandated thing. That's a voluntary thing. But, but still, it's an action that's happening. Mm -hmm. Transport Canada has been is is actually a world leader right now on looking at um, quieting vessel designs. So trying to make it so that ships are quieter in the future. Yeah. Um, so that's a big initiative. The other two species are belugas in the St. Lawrence, where they've got very strict slowdown areas, um, and those are mandatory, um, specifically in um, the uh, Saguenay St. Lawrence Marine Park. And and then North Atlantic right whales are the other ones. And that's more to do with, um, with ship strikes, but underwater noise is a benefit um, on that one as well. So they've got these slowdowns when whales are in the area effectively and um and those slowdowns will lead to reduced underwater noise there's also a really good arctic example um that's that's fairly recent that's in our our area which is um directly linked to our work um so there's a thing that coast guard puts out every year and every month of every year called the notice to mariners it's effect effectively like a um a, a pdf that gets sent out to ship captains <laughs> and um some of our colleagues at DFO 
um, wanted to take some actions within the Inuvialuit settlement region, so in the Western Arctic where I work, and they read one of our papers, and um, we had some specific suggestions about where ships were traveling. They're traveling through a marine protected area. They're traveling through um, some kind of core summer habitat for belugas and bowheads. So we had some suggestions in there about avoiding certain areas going slower. And so kind of building on a bunch of initiatives in the area and also taking the specific recommendations from our paper, they put out a notice to mariners for this area that said, if you're in beluga and bowhead areas, travel 10 knots or less. 10 knots is about 18 kilometers an hour. So it's it's a speed restriction. And then avoid these marine protected areas if at all possible. And if not possible, drive slow when you're going through them. Yeah. Um, so that's a voluntary measure right now. Um, I'm currently working with them to uh, assess how well uh, people are actually complying with this voluntary measure. But based on just a cursory look at the 2020 data, there seems to be evidence that some ships are actually like they're they're going, they're going, they're going. And then it's like, oh, marine protected area, hard right. And they go around it. Um, and so it'll be interesting. That's actually one of the things I'm doing over the next couple of weeks is digging into the shipping data to see how ships are behaving as they're going through this area with voluntary measures. Yeah. Those were the most fantastic examples of all time. That was uh, great. That's so heartening to hear. And, and I hope that uh, there's more work like that done in the future. And, and again, if it's something that people are engaging with voluntarily, fantastic. If it's something that needs to be mandated, and, and again, we've, we've shown a willingness and interest in doing that as a country, that's fantastic. Bill, this has been great. Thank you so, so much for sitting down with me today. And I really appreciate this. And uh, I, again, with work like yours, I, I think that there's a lot of positive future for bringing marine mammals for the Beaufort Sea for all the work that you're doing. So thank you uh, again for, for that work and for sitting down with me today.